So from the road, here I am recording a CISO talk to all of you because what would vacation be if I didn't at least record one episode from somewhere I am, someplace? So the lighting and sound are not going to be the same for this episode. I'm sorry. I've apologized. I've forewarned you, but don't let that be a hindrance to what's about to go down because this is transcontinental kind of stuff that's going to be epic. Max Crone, who's the head of security engineering from Zoom, is going to be joining me. We're going to be talking about you know, Zoom and encryption and all kinds of really cool stuff. So you're going to want to love to stay and tune in and listen to this full episode. If you have not subscribed to our podcast, please make sure to do so right now. If you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe, turn on the notification bell. If you haven't subscribed to the CyberHub podcast, do so right now while you're waiting. You know, you can minimize this on your favorite podcast app. Go to the top, search CyberHub podcast, subscribe, tune in. There you'll see daily content. CyberHub podcast has daily content. CISO Talk has weekly. So check that out. Now, without further ado, why waste more time with intros? You guys know to subscribe. You guys know to follow. But you guys are all here for one purpose. You guys want to hear from Max. So I'm going to go get him. We'll be right back, folks. Here we go. It's CISO Talk time. From the Cyber Hub Bunker in studio, you're listening to the CISO Talk Podcast. No sales. No bullshit. Just straight talk. Straight talk. And now for your host and CISO, James Azar. Max, what is happening? What is up, James? Thank, thank you so much for having me on the uh, podcast. Uh, I'm envious to hear that you're on vacation. I've been lost in this closet for well over a year. I can tell. Um, and I just want to let you know that there is a sun shining behind you because of the time difference. I can't show you the sun here because it's nighttime, but nonetheless, it's still a great time. I, I got to tell you, you know, as we kind of get started, so I'm, I'm, I'm in Northern Israel and last night. So in, in the city I'm in, in Northern Israel, which is Haifa, they have a wild boar problem. So because of the expansion of the city, wild boars are starting to make their way in within the population and they're looking for food. So last night, as my wife and I were walking back to our apartment, lo and behold, we see a wild boar, probably the size of a pony, just across the street staring at us. Now, if that thing comes at you, that's three, 400 pounds of just muscle baby so what happened we quietly walked without making any eye contact <laughs> got behind the gate of the apartment <laughs> building closed it and we're like because <sighs> apparently if they attack you and bite you you have to take 15 shots in your stomach for six months you know we have those in new york city i i, I think that rats basically get to that size as well so you know we have a similar <laughs> problem <laughs> they tend to go for the pizza though, not for the not for the human beings. Yeah, but if you agitate a wild boar, <laughs> so I can never have boar's head meat ever again. No, right? No. Like after last night, now that I've actually seen what a wild boar looks like in the wild, I am grateful for the Second Amendment and hunting. Because that'll be one animal I'm gonna enjoy hunting sooner than rather uh, than later. I'm, I'm picturing the scene in the uh in the princess ride when he, when he uh, wrestles with rodents of unusual uh, size. That's my <laughs> mental image. You, you find that boar rolling around on the ground with him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in my head as we were walking, I'm like, if he comes after us right now, like I got to throw down. I can't be like, you know, I can't run. Right. I got to throw down. I got to tell my wife to run. And I'm like, honey, go, you know, and I'm like, it's going to be me and the wild boar. And, you know, one of us will, emerge victorious we'll see who that is but luckily i did it it's a fun story though seeing a wild I mean, boar i don't know how many people see have seen wild boars though because it's not a very common animal i i haven't i hear they're pretty there are a lot of them in california from what i hear right um in, in the hills up yeah in, a lot of them in like uh yosemite and yellowstone yeah. and, and yeah. whatnot yeah but you know it's weird in haifa wild right. boars right well I, it's I mean, not even totally a kosher animal <laughs> well, with COVID, <laughs> nature was healing, right? So that's uh, that was nature healing for a while there. 
So maybe it was. It, it absolutely <laughs> was. So folks, done with the wild boar movie. Max Crowd, he's the head of security engineering over at Zoom. Max, you've kind of had the uh, ultimate career path almost, right? Because you've started a company and you went from a vendor to a buyer. So, so give our audience a little bit of background on you. Uh, uh, sure thing, James. Um, I, I will say I've, I've been more or less in the uh, in the startup business, uh, you know, since 1999. That, that was the first startup I was involved with. Uh, I was lucky enough to kind of meet up with the right people at the right time. Um, and and back then we started a uh, my my co uh, founders and I started a company that did educational uh, tools, and so it was called SparkNotes, um, which which might be something that parents have heard of in, in the United States. It's just like, a, it's a way to, to kind of not, learn about the book you're reading without having to read the book um, uh, for high school students. So that's where we got our start. Um, and kind of one thing led to another. Um, we started another company in 2003, more or less the same team, and that was in the dating space. Uh, and so we started a, um, a dating website called OkCupid um, back in 2003. Uh, that was, um, you know, back in the, in the day when no one really thought much about online dating. It seemed like a pretty niche business with, with um, people who, you know, might need extra help finding uh, finding dates and it, you know, before it became, you know, mainstream like, like it is today. So we were kind of in the early, early parts of that business. Um, and then, um, you know, one of the lessons we had in that business actually, you know, relevant to today's conversation is that um, we knew as the provider of the service that there was a lot of very personal data that we were in charge of safeguarding. Um, and, and the you know the working model at, at OkCupid was of the form that people would answer questions kind of like quizzes in the back of style magazine to, to kind of get a sense for you know their, their preferences right and those can be anything from like your favorite color or, um, favorite color to like your favorite flavor of chocolate milk to you know maybe more personal preferences you know that um, that would help you find the right mate but might be embarrassing if they were ever leaked out to the internet and so we, we knew we were in charge of some very important and um, sensitive data and we knew that the state of the art for for you know safeguarding that data wasn't great i i mean back then you didn't hear about data breaches every other day but we certainly knew that the possibility was there um and sometime in that process you know you would hear about like maybe one of the biggest earliest ones i remember was maybe a linkedin data breach a data breach back in the late 2000s potentially if my if memory serves and so you knew that all this data that was kind of being collected on these big servers, if ever it got out, it would be a real problem. And so after we were done with uh, OkCupid, we kind of sold that to Match.com uh, or the Match company um, in 2010. Uh, one of the co-founders of, of OkCupid and I, we started another company called Keybase. And here we were really focused on security. And um, one of our um, hypotheses was that uh, people eventually were, were going to want a better way to secure data and maybe not upload plain text into the cloud. Instead, they'd want to upload only encrypted data into the cloud. And that way, if there was ever a breach, then, um, you know, worst comes to worst, cyber text escape is escaping and that's not as catastrophic as plain text. Uh, and so, so that was like kind of one of the original insights we had when we started uh, Keybase back in 2014. Um, uh, other things we were thinking about at the time, um, and it's not as relevant to today's con conversation, is that, you know, that was in some ways the early days of Bitcoin. And, and so we, we, we thought that maybe there might be some future in which people needed to transact with each other with electric payments and wanted to know each other's identity. And we thought maybe Keybase would be a way to build on that trend. And we also were thinking a lot about the Snowden revelations back then too. We thought there might be a more of a market for encrypted communication back then. And we wanted to build some of the tooling that we thought would be um, required if ever we got there. That's, that's awesome. So talk a little bit about the journey over the last, you know, 15, 16 months, because you guys went from, you know, a company kind of on your own to being all absorbed by, you know, what what many people consider to be the number one conferencing platform on the planet today, which is Zoom. Yeah. Um, so in 2020, um, we were at a point in our business where you know, we were thinking about the future. Um, and, you know, in the space, uh, there were some, some very big successes. You know, you, you look at Signal, which, which is since then become um, a household name. And they were in, in some ways running away with the with, with the um, messaging space. And that was something that we were buying for. We had a, a bunch of other um, very interesting businesses as well. But around that time, you know, Zoom approached us and, you know, it seemed like a really good combination of, of you know, two complementary technologies. 
Um, and so if you look at Zoom, you know, they had a platform that was obviously connecting millions of people um, a day, an hour. I mean, who knows what it was at the time? It was huge. And you had uh, our company, Keybase, which was really good at building out infrastructure for um, providing, for, for bootstrapping an end-to-end -end encrypted or an end-to-end -end, uh, verified uh, conversation. Uh, and these two technologies actually fit together really well. So it was one of these um, really good cases in which the, the two companies could, could do a lot more together than they could on their own. Um, and we thought that we could use the same tech that we were already building and apply it to these platform and achieve you know, a huge multiple of the scale that we were already operating at. Um, and if you think about the, the team that we've attracted, uh, attracted at Keybase over the years, so it's really a very mission-focused um, team that, that that believes in this mission of bringing end-to-end -end encryption to as many people as possible. Um, and if you think about um, you know everyone who currently works here and Excel, the whole team moved over to Zoom, 100% of our team. Um, and we thought this was a great way to um, to achieve this mission at a much higher scale. And we and we thought it was a great opportunity, so we're, so we're pretty excited about it. But you know, in general, we feel like everyone, not just the computer experts, should have the um, it should be able to, to achieve end-to-end -end encryption. Um, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. We feel like you should have this right to privacy and to, and, and to keep what you're saying to someone who you think is almost in the room with you on the basis of the medium to make it actually technically be as if they're in the room with you in terms of can this conversation be um, snooped on or not. And so we think this is uh, a, a technology that can improve many people's lives. Uh, and so we're, we're really happy to get it out to as many people as possible. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of end-to-end uh, uh, -end encryption. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and and I will say I am a big advocate of privacy as well. Let's talk a little bit about leadership because sure. in your careers, you've been around a lot of startups. And for a lot of people that are looking to kick off a cybersecurity career, they're always wondering, do I go to an established big company or do I go into a startup? Mm -hmm. What are some of the qualities that you think really kind of I've always made you be in the startup world now for, for over 20 some odd years. Yeah. I, I mean, if you think about, uh, you know, technology is a different point in their life cycles you know, the problems you're solving are just different. Right. I, I think at a startup, there is so much room for innovation and innovation of the, uh, of the form that, you know, we don't have a legacy product and we don't have any existing consumers. And so we can build something exactly the way we want to build it. Um, and you know, this is our vision for a product, and, and, and this is how we want to go out and achieve it. And I think uh, you could, you could do that in a startup. It's a lot harder to do in a big enterprise company when you already have customers, and you you know you have the demands of you know whatever financial demands are, are upon you as a company. Um, and I think it's like a different calculus there. So if you think about the things that like you know Zoom is working on on a day by day basis, it, it's they're probably a lot more um, catering to our, our users and our customers and our um in you know what we communicate to shareholders and. What Keybase was focusing on on a day to day basis as a startup was here's this technology that hasn't really been commercialized well. You know, how do we, you know, it, how do we think creatively about getting it into a lot of people's hands? And how do we make Keybase as a product more relevant to people? And, you know, that, that could mean doing something very different today than we did the day before. Um, and so I, I think that's like one of the real advantages on, on working on a, on a startup. You have a little bit more flexibility in, into like, you know, to trying to find the path from where you are to success and in a bigger company, obviously. It's a little bit harder to do that. So that's one of the advantages, I think, of working um, in a startup. It, it's a little bit easier. It's easier to innovate in, in that context just because that's what you're there for. I mean, you, your investors want you to innovate and, you know, you are probably attracted to the business because you think there's the potential for innovation. And I think everyone's aligned mainly along that, um, you know, primarily like along that goal. Um, and, and so, you know, as, as, as someone who's trying to figure out in their career, you know, where do you want to work? I mean, I think it's really a question of, you know, do you want to build something that might not work <laughs> and we have to really scratch your head every day and think creatively about how to make it work? Or do you want to take something that you know a lot of people are using and make it better? I, I think those are, that's fundamentally the trade-off and, you know, different people, I, I think, think about those problems differently and, and um, you know, might, might plan their careers, uh, uh, you know, in accordance. Um, one thing I will say about, um, you, know, you know, leading a team here at Keybase and, you know, one thing we've always done in terms of attracting a very talented um, and uh, a team that's really committed to what we're building is we always have a, a pretty passive um, recruiting process. I, I think we really like, we try not to, to convince people to come work at Keybase because 
um, you know, for reasons they, they don't, you know, already know coming into it. Rather, what we do is we try to attract people who think this is a great idea. And like, and I think the one thing we can say for that style of, of building a team is that when someone walks in the door, um, it's not going to be a question of motivating them properly and getting them to, you know, to, to show up and think hard about the problem, both at work and after work. It's something that they want to do just as much as you do. Um, and that's something we've always really had the, um, the, the real luxury and uh, the privilege, um, those types of people who have the privilege of working here at Keybase. And I know a lot of times, you know, at, at a bigger company or um, a, a company that might not be working as interesting a space as we are, you know, it's a little bit more of a recruiting game, which, you know, you're, you're just fighting against some other company to, to just to woo people to your side. And, you know, it makes for a, a different culture within the company, I think, when you get there. Yeah, it creates a it, it it creates a different different path as someone who's been on both sides of that. I, I definitely enjoy the startup a little bit more. The dynamics of it are are, are greater. Also, yeah. your ability to shine and really go and think beyond you know out of bounds, as one would argue, yeah, is 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 far more. There's a lot more flexibility and and willingness for that than than per se a a, a larger more established organization. Yeah, and, and you can think about what our engineers are doing on a daily basis, and it could vary. It could be either they're they're working on an iPhone app, or they're building out a server component, or they're doing just whatever it takes to get the job done. I think there's a lot of that in a startup. That just you know we're gonna get this thing out the door, we're gonna make it good, and you know we don't have any other requirements. Whereas in a big company with established customers, you're like, well, we're gonna maybe include this library, but we have to make sure it, it's complying along all the reasons we care about and our, and our customers care about. And um, you know that's been checked by you know these various uh, um, you know automated checking routines and and you know that obviously makes a lot of sense for the context of a large company. It just means you're gonna the the, the, the cycle of innovation is gonna be slow because you know just to do the most basic, right. basic thing to pull a library off the shelf, it's now it's now a question you have to think hard about, not just like let's get the product out the door on this fast as we can. Right. The, the, there's also that reputation mix. Right when a company that's established that launches something that isn't very good, their reputational hit is greater. And when you have shareholders and stock prices, that tends to be a greater risk for the organization mm -hmm. than a startup that says, "Eh, if we burn, we'll just change our name and do it all over again." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean that, that was definitely what we were thinking at OP Keep It. Now to, to argue against what I just said at Keybase, we did we did this additional concern. That is that uh, we were telling people that we are we are securing their most important secrets, and it was incumbent on, upon us not to mess it up. And, and so, right. you know, we had to be concerned. We had to be convinced ourselves that we were building high quality software. We didn't have to jump through other hoops to convince other people we were doing. Uh, we were doing what we said we were doing, and I think that's maybe a difference. That like, you know, at a big company like like Zoom, we, we both have to be, you know, convinced ourselves that we're linking up the right library, and also that our customers. Various regulatory regimes would also be happy with it as well as part of you know our commitments to them, and so that that's like an extra layer of things you might have to think about before before anything goes out the door. So, so you brought up something very interesting here, and I kind of want to want to um, um, take you to to, to I'm I'm kind of going to move around a little bit for sure. a second. Yeah, I typically like to spend more time on leadership, but but I'm going to skip right through it. You talked a little bit about building high quality software. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the last nine months of the security world software has been the achilles here of almost every major sequence of cyber security incidents that yeah. cyber criminals have taken out against their victims mm -hmm. right so talk a little bit about the, that process of you guys saying it was a real concern for us to build high quality software what were some of the things that you guys really took into, you know, you paid attention to? What are some of the things that you say, you know what, I wish we would have done more of this or I'm so happy we did more of this because of this we did, we were able to accomplish X. Right. Well, I mean, if I could rewind a little bit to the key base days because that's, you know, right. um, a little bit uh, in some ways we had some, some pretty interesting calls to make. So. There was a time in our company's history at Keybase where we were um, funded by a cryptocurrency and funded to the extent that you know we made a partnership to um, to give users on our platform balances in their cryptocurrency. So one day, if you were a Keybase user in 2000, 
think it was 19, you would show up and there would be an actual balance of money in your account. And, you know, we had a concern with this. Our concern was the supply chain attack. And so what we thought was, you know, the, the key base client at that point was open source. Anybody can look at GitHub and see, you know, what was, uh, you know, they could build it for themselves. They could, you know, they could experiment with the software however they wanted to. Um, and they knew exactly what our dependencies were. And so we were thinking that if everyone on Keybase had a balance of, you know, $100 of cryptocurrency, and you could simultaneously get a million Keybase uh, accounts to, to be, I mean, uh, install to behave the way you wanted to, that would be a quick $100 million. Seems like a pretty good incentive to potentially look at one of our dependencies and take it out. Um, and, you know, I know this happens from time to time in the, um, in the NPM Node.js ecosystem. I think very famously there was, um, there was a similar attack made against the Bitcoin wallet, I, I think, with, with this uh, very low level library that no one thought anything about. And some, in one day, some guy just gave up maintaining it. He said, I'm, I'm, you know, I have too much stuff to do. I can't maintain this library. Someone else took it over and installed a, a basically a backdoor that would, for the express purposes of, of draining a wallet. And so we had to come up with some countermeasure because we knew it was probably impossible to do a, a thorough audit on all the code we depended on. And so we basically adopted this policy where we would freeze everything for you know six months and say like, you know, at that point we were hoping that if there was a problem with it, it would have been shaken out. But we were we were very slow to adopt, you know, new changes. Um, and so that you know that, that was one thing that we thought could, could help protect us against these supply chain attacks. But you know, when it comes down to it, it's a huge problem because even that countermeasure of just you know not taking any updates until they've been vetted by you know this the internet hive line, which may or may not vet the software, but hopefully would. Um, you know, that was one kind of measure, but like you could probably find someone who's, who's smart enough to go around that and just have this latent, you know, a backdoor hidden in code for, for six months out. And so this is an extremely complicated problem and anyone who says they have a good solution for, I, I don't know if I fully, um, you know, would buy it, but, but obviously it's the same thing that led to you know, more or less solar winds where, you know, it was, it was somewhere deep in the supply chain where, you know, this, this hack, uh, you know, originated and it was more or less lying in wait for a while. And so, you know, these are the kinds of things we're thinking about. Um, we think a lot about, you know, uh, you know, kind of making a little bit more concrete, like the things, like the worst types of bugs that, that tend to hit people the most. So you think about buffer overruns and, you know, memory management issues. And obviously we do everything in our, in our, in, you know, in our power to make sure we don't hit those issues. But, um, it depends on the technology you're using and, um, you know, you just uh, have to put in place the right processes to make sure those bugs don't affect you. But, um, I, you know, as long as I've been a software engineer, I've, I've been aware and people I've worked with have been aware that there are just, uh, there are a lot of sharp edges. And um, it's, you know, it's hard to point fingers and say like, oh, those people at SolarWinds didn't know what they were doing because, you know, it's just, you have to think about it from the totality of all the things that could possibly go wrong and, you know, the size of the target on your back and you know doing as well as you can to mitigate risk um, in a world where there's obviously danger um, lurking on all sides of what you're trying to do. Yeah, I, I think anyone that likes to point the finger at solar winds and say they should have, could have, or would have are, um, are, are a little bit uh, unplugged from the reality of how hard security really is and how hard it is to go to large organizations and corporations. You know, there's a reason why SolarWinds, Equifax, um, a lot of those big companies get hit. It's because they're legacy corporations that are trying to slowly and responsibly upgrade parts of their business mm -hmm. while trying to build some level of security. And that's not an easy task. There's no one single tool or no one single thing that one person can do yeah. that could you know, bring about perfect security. I mean, the word perfect is an anomaly in security. Uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, it, it makes, it also makes sense to think about, we have lots of automated tooling, it's great tooling, we should right. use it all, but the tooling is only addressing the threats that, that, that we thought about, and there obviously could be threats we haven't thought about for which there isn't tooling. And you know, there's one thing, you, you know, you could say about bad guys that they're very creative and they're always thinking about new attacks that, you might, that, that you might not. You can look at all well, the problems. Go ahead. No, no, but we're seeing it now. Think of your endpoints, right? So, you know, you said you've been stuck in this little part of your house 
for the le- for the better part of a year. And we've all been stuck in our homes. You know, I'm lucky um, and, I, and I'm blessed and I'm grateful to be able to, you know, actually travel abroad for the first time in a long time and, and see family I haven't seen in a while. But for a lot of people, our endpoints have changed. Our work environment and work life balance has changed. Mm-hmm. And we, we start, we, we got to start thinking of what are the, now in the new hybrid model where a lot of companies are doing this flex work, maybe, maybe spend a day in the office and four days work from, you know, home or wherever you want to work from. I think that's going to be, it's, it's going to be critical um, to, to rethink our endpoints and criminals are already doing it. Cri- criminals have done it for us. I don't know about you, but I get over 80 or 90 text messages a day that are all spam. <laughs> all spam. For, for, for me, it's all about the New York City local elections. I, I mean, that, that's like 10 text messages a day there about the primaries coming up. So um, I, I'm, it would be a great fishing attempt to try to try to put a root kit in one of those, uh, you know, vote for, um, uh, you know, Eric Adams for, for, for mayor. <laughs> but, but yeah, no. I, I agree. Uh, security is difficult, right? I mean, you're you, when you talked about, you know, the things that we can and can't control, you brought up, I think, which is a great point, which is how do you deal with the stuff you can't control? Yeah, and, you know, I will say that, you know, before I was at uh, Kiva, I forgot to mention this, um, I, I was uh, in an academic computer science program for, for five years, and you know, these are the problems that academic computer scientists, you know, we, we used to think about in 2003 to 2008 when I was last at the academy. You know, if you're, if you have a bad kernel module, how do you know if you're, do you have any more guarantees about what your system is or is not capable of? And, you know, some very creative people might have said back then, well, yeah, if you change the world in a lot of interesting ways. And, and so um, I think it's really great that people were thinking about those problems, and they still are, of course, but um, you know, the difference between now and then is, you know, back then when we used to study these things, it was all like a theoretical attack. And nowadays, it seems like anything we thought about theoretically, you know, 10 years ago, it's been done, and it, like successfully pulled off. And so, you know, I think we were right to think about all the problems. I think, uh, uh, you know, some of them might not have good solutions. Um, but I will say, though, um, I, I feel like one of the biggest improvements in, in the last 10 years has been, uh, you know, at least iOS. And if you think about iOS, the containment model is just leaps and bounds better than what you have on your desktop. And so if you install that app, like it's not this problem anymore that, you know, you're toast. It's just like, you know, if you install that app, that that app can potentially track your location if you let it, but it's not going to be able to reach into another app, at least not unless there's a bug in the kernel, and pull that app's data out and exfiltrate it. And I think that's a huge advantage. Um, that we've gotten as a result of the move to mobile in a lot of cases. And so, you know, if it were my job to, like, you know, if I were like an IT manager and I was worried about people's home devices, you know, I'd feel great about, you know, the base layer, layer of security you get from an iOS. And I'd feel a little bit more nervous about, like, what you would get from a standard uh, desktop uh, operating system like Windows or, or Mac, just because those are legacy technologies that, you know, that they weren't built with these threats in mind. You know, they were built with like, right. you know, in a much different threat model and have all these legacy use cases for them. And it's just impossible to say, you know, we want like, you know, we want uh, my Mac OS operating system to, to isolate its apps from each other because users don't want that. They want their apps to be able to like use the same data. And so, you know, it, it's a big problem. And, um, you know, I, I do not envy the, the work of IT managers who have to go in and make sure endpoints are secure, whether at the office or, as you mentioned, at home, it seems even harder. Um, but, uh, you know, like, what if I don't do this, but, like, what if my kids came in and started, you know, installing new apps on my work computer, right? I, I mean, that's like, you know, that what there didn't used to be a problem when I had to go to my office. And now that, you know, I might, like, step away to the bathroom and leave my keyboard on lock, which I never would do, but if I made that mistake, then they can come in and, you know, and, and ruin my company's security policy, right? So I, I think you're right that the threat has has mutated in such a way where there's a lot more um, attack points um, and, and a lot more ways beyond the perimeter. I mean, the perimeter has moved all the way out to our home. It used to at least be like within the portal. There's no more perimeter. Yep. There's no more perimeter. And now that we're going into, we're going back to normal, th- that there is no real perimeter because the flex workspace is now, isn't it, you know, when we were quarantined, I can single, I, I can actually, as an IT manager or security manager, right, go in and say, all right, Max lives off of 
fifth and you know and and 71st west 74st street that's so close. <laughs> right I, I i don't know that you do but, you know that's i'm just close. saying well yeah. well fifth isn't on the west side it's on the east side right yeah. so I, you'd, you'd have to be <laughs> further down maybe you're on 71st and 12th whatever that is right uh, of manhattan but um and and i would coordinate that that would be where you would log in from right i would almost fence you in a specific location but that's not always the case um, in in modern um, in in modern now in the right. new kind of flex workspace because mm -hmm. you know what you could be uh, companies have now hired people from other parts of the country yep. and right. if they want to give them a day where they have to go work from an office per se they're going to go and set up a we work or spaces or a Regis office and. Mm -hmm that's a whole new set of parameters and that's a whole new different fence and that's a whole new different, you know, yeah. uh, uh, set of threats that you've got to deal with. But beyond just work from home, and I don't want us to get stuck on that. I think the, the, the concept of what's going on in security today is one, which I thought you brought up, which is the idea of how do we build very good software? Cause people are trusting us with data. Well, you know, zoom, I thought had one of the better responses when all of this went on, which is, Hey, people are hijacking, you know, all these little Zoom conversations and people were like, look, Zoom isn't secure. And I'm like, or is it bad hygiene by the user? And I'm not saying that because you're on the show. I'm kind of, I sent this back then. I'm like, if you're reusing the same conference call link and you send it out to a bunch of people, you're bound to have someone hop on your call. Exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, this, this was obviously a hot topic um, a year ago. I, I mean, we, we think of Zoom, and this is in my part of the work, and it's not my problem, but, but we as a company think a lot about meeting disruption and how to mitigate it. Um, if you think about it from a security perspective, I think what's interesting is, is that, you know, long before COVID-19, Zoom was, was, I think it's, you know, one of its most important driving missions was make it easy. They can work, right. and it's always got to be easy. It's always got to be work. We've all been in this experience of not being able to get into a video conference. It's one thing or another didn't work. So Zoom was laser focused on like everyone getting into their meetings, and you know there's a match. There's a very natural tension here. Like the easier it is for you to get into your meeting, the easier it is for someone who you didn't intend to also get into your meeting, right? And so you know this is where Zoom said, and as mature companies do this, they they need to. They need to adapt as the as the threats change, and so Zoom said we're going to put a little bit more friction into people getting into their meetings. So maybe we'll have a waiting room for certain meetings. They will have a pass a passcode, um, and or maybe we'll have a requirement that you have to be in the same domain as I'm in. And that's all those are more friction, but it has the advantage that it does cut people out of the meeting. Um, and I think you know once the company has has reached a certain scale, they they both you know don't have to be laser focused on growth and user activation as much as possible and they have different threats they need to actually make these changes and like a, a good analogy here i think is like maybe consider facebook i mean when facebook was first launched they made it so simple for everyone to you know to, to connect with everyone right everyone could see everything about everyone it was wide open and this is what you wanted to make the graph as rich as possible and make the interaction as rich as possible then when they start saturating the world they said well we got to actually tighten privacy a little bit here we have to we have a spam problem we have a scamming problem we have like a bad user experience, we have a stopping problem, you know, like all the problems that they had, and they had to like, you know, turn the privacy knobs up. And so it's like a very natural thing that like a company needs to do at different points in their life, uh, in, in, in their lifetime. And I think, you know, Zoom, you know, when, right around the time that I the keynotes got here, they made a ton of investment um, in, into, you know, maybe changing the dynamics about, you know, friction around joining meetings, and I think it was, it was for the best. I think I hear a lot less about meeting disruption now, and I think a lot of those techniques have been quite effective. Um, but uh, you know, there yeah, it's such it's, it's a really annoying problem because you only need like a handful of really bad actors to just make your life you know a real headache. And it's just like you know, there are always going to be these bad actors that have these you know just like incentives like don't work for them because they're just and, and like you know every platform has these and you know it's just like a tax on you know trying to do your mission right. You have these people who are you know just just for whatever reason this is what they want to do. So. Um, no, you, you 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 bring up such a good point, and I, I thought you know the Microsoft doctrine, which was adopted later during the Solari Gate, which is you know information, 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 share as much information as possible, 
Zoom did a really good job of doing that as well. And now you look at it as a practitioner and you go, I, I trust companies that communicate, right? Like I tend to trust a company that communicates more than a company that stays silent. Sure. I am worried when you're quiet, <laughs> right? Like yeah. I'm worried when you're quiet. Yeah. I'm worried with a generic statement and it's, it's a problem for me to go to the business unit and say, we should keep working with these people when they're super quiet. Cause I think it inherently creates a different set of challenges because I don't know what I'm dealing with. And yeah. now I've got to waste time, money and resources trying to investigate something that I have no information on. And I thought what Zoom did and what Microsoft did, and you know, I, I was hoping we'd see others do the same because the, the success there is inherent, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at the stock price, if you look at the consumer confidence in the brands, yeah. think of, you know, they're not shaken. I, because I people great, trust communications. I, I think it's a, a great point. And something I, I, have, I, I think no credit for, right when I got here at Zoom, you know, there, there were like four or five mm -hmm. parallel um, huge uh, operations going at once. Like one was the buy key base, and that was probably one of the smaller ones. You know, a bigger one was a huge investment and that they built out a whole security team, which my team isn't even really a part of. We obviously work very closely with them, but it's a whole different organization. Um, and, you know, at the same time, the communication, I, I, I was, you know, I got here before that big security team was, was fully hired up. So I was kind of put into a role where I was doing what they should be doing early on. And I was, you know, I was doing webinars when I was, it was Eric, Eric Yuan, our, our CEO, and, and, and I were these webinars talking about, you know, how to make Zoom more secure. And we were taking questions from, you know, from our, everyone from stock analysts to like users to CISOs, you know, they were, they were in the webinar giving us very good questions that, that made us, you know, think hard and, 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 and think about how to deliver a better and more secure product. Um, and so that's part of the communication. I, I know there's been a lot of work with CISOs, um, and I've been on some of those panels where um, you know, major industries have um, you know, CISOs who they can send to Zoom and kind of talk to us about the issues they have. And, and it's, it's very hard for us to know exactly, um, you know, different verticals, um, different geographies, what their issues are. But I think there's, I, I've been personally in a lot of conversations with, with, with a great exchange of information, and that seems really important. Because if I was sitting here and trying to guess, I would definitely write down like you know, the, the top eight things I would say would be wrong. And so it's so useful to, to get the exact feedback from the people who really care about it. I know like and Zoom's made like, an incredible investment in that. And uh, I think, you know, from when I've seen, I think it, it's paid off. I, I think you know, people are, are very happy to work with us and make the product better. Because it matters a ton to the company too. I mean, we know, I mean, and Eric, the CEO said it. I mean, we realized this was a huge threat for the success of the company. And I think they made a huge investment in it. And uh, I think it is taken extremely seriously here. So, um, well, th th they brought you guys in, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they took you from a private entity and made you part of Zoom yeah. because they took it seriously. So, yeah. so you know, one of the key questions that's on every CISO's mind is always, how do I relate more to the business, right? How do I get the business to pay more attention to security without really um, using FUD? right? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or, you know, chicken little my way through a board meeting. The sky's falling if I don't get X amount of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you've, you've been in the seat now as a practitioner, you've been in the seat yeah. as a vendor, you've been in the seat as a startup founder. What are some of the things that would resonate for you if you were not security minded, or as you're speaking to people who aren't security minded, trying to get, trying to win them over for security? Yeah, I think that's a great, great question. I, I, you know, I don't know if this is what a good answer is. The first thing that pops into my mind, so I'll say it. You know, and Zoom is in some sense its DNA of enterprise software. I mean, we've had this, this huge uh, consumer application over the last year, but I think you know, our, run, our, our bread and butter is talking to CISOs, talking to our, our enterprise customers. And, you know, the one thing I, I'm always thinking is, like, how do we make Zoom more like other successful consumer apps? Um, that have a great security story, right? And you, know, if you think about WhatsApp, you think about Signal, and these, these are, you know, WhatsApp obviously more so than Signal, but these are not a, a, any longer niche applications. These are hugely successful with, with incredible market penetration. And 
you know, we just say like, you know, the sky's, it's not that the sky is falling, it's like, but all these people over here have great ideas. So how do we synthesize these ideas and more, better than that, improve upon them and bring them to our customers? And so this is the kind of thing I, you know, in our lane, like what we're thinking most about, you know, how we, how we talk about end-to-end -end encryption, you know, how we bring it into the product, how we, you know, as much as possible escape friction and, um, and, and downsides to using the technology because there are certainly downsides to using end-to-end -end encryption. Um, I would be misspeaking or I would say otherwise, but at the same time, we know that consumer adoption of this technology has been massive. I mean, you've got iMessage is another good example, right? And this is a great example, like, um, and, and, you know, this is an anecdote, I don't know if it's true, but, you know, amongst teenagers these days, they'll have a group conversation. And, you know, and if everyone's on the iOS platform, all the iMessages are all blue, right? But if one person shows up with a Google phone and now it's SMS, then it's green, right? And the whole, and the whole group goes to green. And we're all, you know, everyone's really upset at that one person who flipped their nice blue messages to green messages, right? And, um, and, and this is like brilliant marketing by Apple, right? Because they're now exerting social pressure on the ground to get that last holdout, you know, to switch to iOS. And it also means it's impossible for these kids to switch off of iOS to Android because they'd be subject to the same peer pressure. At the same time, though, it, it, it is, you know, iMessage protocol is way more secure than SMS. So it's not just a marketing thing. It's actually doing, you know, everyone in the group a, a, a favor by making their communication more secure. And so I, I think... You know, in consumer, you see a lot of good ways to make people want security, right? And I, I think that the challenge for enterprise is to do the same thing. And um, I, I think it's, it, it, you know, if we can do it, I, I think we're going to obviously serve our customers better. But I also think it's a huge business win because, um, you know, there, there's some ways in which security is more sticky than than, than something that, that doesn't have security. I mean, if you have a secure product, that probably means your, your app is managing a secret key. Um, that, that's got to follow the user around, and it's very hard to move that secret key onto another device. I mean, that's like an inherent problem in, in encryption technology, which we don't want to be in the business of moving these secret keys around. At the same time, it really helps people stay on the ecosystem and not try something else. So I think there's both a huge opportunity to serve our customers better by rolling this technology up, and also a great business opportunity to keep people um, engaged with the product long term, because you know, if we can get to the point where we have the best security and we get there first. Yeah, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that question, by the way, Max. Okay. I think there's there's a lot of ideas to get um, CISOs and get security practitioners. I think the more we talk about this, the more we learn. And the stuff that you brought up is great because I think a lot of people could relate to the iMessage protocol, right, and peer pressure um, than they would yeah. per se other. Yeah, and this is a very important point we, we feel like we make a lot, that your meeting is only as secure as the least secure participant. So right. if it's the three of us and we have end-to-end -end encryption, I mean, you know, Yumi James and, and someone else, you know, Carol, and we all have end-to-end -end encryption, but Carol has like a video camera pointed at her screen and she's like live streaming to YouTube. I mean, guess what? Our meeting's not secure anymore. So, um, you know, people do need to get in this mindset that to keep the whole thing secure, it's like not the most secure person, it's the least secure person. And you know, we have, we're all thinking on the same page and feel like, you know, we're okay with security this meeting. You know, we can conduct our top secret business. We don't want the bad guys to leak, but we're gonna stay on Twitter and you know, and short sell our stock or something. You know, there's like a lot of money on the line for these meetings. There's a lot of economic incentives to keep these meetings secure, you know, like and let's just get the customers aligned with, you know, the, the economic incentives. I mean, that's maybe another way to think about it. Yeah, that's um, that, that that that's a brilliant way of looking at it. Is I could have a camera pointing here that you wouldn't even see and be in frame, or I can have a recording device, or I can have five hundred yep. different things that can yep. be streaming or recording yep. or going somewhere, yep. and no one would know. Yep. And being that I'm in Israel, I'm fairly confident someone's <laughs> watching this podcast even before it goes live at this point, going like. That's a really good show you guys are having over there, you know? I should probably get the entire 8200 unit right. listening to this okay. and all the make, most. Make my phone ring. Make my phone ring. Yeah. <laughs> um, and get all those guys online, too. We're almost out of time. I want to kind of uh, ha have a, have some good fun with you. So okay. I want to get into our CISO Insight round, and it's, it's, okay. it's a lot of fun. And so I have a legendary, legendary buzzword graveyard. It's a graveyard filled with buzzwords. What buzzword would you bury in my graveyard, never to be seen or heard from again? 
I'm going to say BYOK because end to end is just better. <laughs> That's a first, man. That's a good one. End to end is 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 much much better. By the way, yeah, the, your key material is staying is staying local with BYOK. There's got to be more movement of key material. I think we should all be going all in on end to end. But I, you know, I know a lot of people want BYOK because they, you know, they read about it and, uh, you know, maybe, but but I think end to end is a better technology. I mean, maybe, I I, th I think the biggest challenge in cryptography is BYOK. I think the biggest challenge in cryptography is not the cryptography, but the key management. Yeah. No. And key management is significantly difficult. Yeah. It, and it, 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 uh, 100 percent. This is what we've worked. This is what Keybase has worked on for six years, and we know it's hard. And we know that you know what we're doing is way ahead of any of the standards bodies. It's, it, it's like no one's thinking along these lines, but it's the way to go. It's like you know, it's the it's it's the lesson of Signal and the lesson of WhatsApp, the lesson of iMessage is that you know you, this, the secret key never leaves well, the device, and you push the security all the way out to the end. Signal won the war. It's true, but, I mean, but, there's, but there's still maybe a hundredth the size. I, I, I'm guessing hundredth the size of WhatsApp, a thousandth the size. Uh, well, so well you know, yeah, but 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 I think that's only because in a lot of countries where freedoms aren't respected. Um, Signal is excluded from those app stores. So Signal isn't allowed to be downloaded in places like, let's say, Qatar or yeah. Egypt or, you know, some of those countries where human rights are less of a value um, to people, to, to those governments, uh, and they want to have backdoors. Not to say that WhatsApp has a backdoor, but it's fair to assume that based on a lot of the recent court stuff that we've seen and some of the documentation – that your conversations in WhatsApp aren't so private. I've been off of WhatsApp since January. And, you know, being in Israel, Israel's a WhatsApp heavy country and everyone right. uses WhatsApp. Right. Well, to me, what I always found a little bit suspicious of WhatsApp is they're always encouraging you to sync your messages to the cloud. And right. if, if you do that, I'm pretty sure you just broke all the guarantees ED can give you because your cloud provider, you know, probably has your plain text at that point or some. Some ability for you to add a new phone and get the get the plain text on your on your new phone, um, and, and so I think that's basically breaks end to end right there. I, I know a like, signal had a very like kind of it, it involved a SGX. So it wasn't a secure record. Have, have you used on. WhatsApp, Max? Have do you use WhatsApp? I, I use it a little bit. I not very. I use it because my my daughter's um, first grade class, the parents talk on WhatsApp, so that's my only application for it. And I always yeah. got to say, don't back up to the internet. I, I don't want to do that. So. Two things I would urge you to do. One, you can download your data off of WhatsApp and you can get it in HTML or you can get it in JSON. If you take yeah. it in JSON and you play around with it for a little bit, yeah. you'll quickly realize a bunch of facts. And that's where I'll leave it. Okay. okay. That's where I'll leave it because it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get a, another legal letter from WhatsApp going, stop bad mouthing us on your show. And I'm like, it's all true. It's all true. Right. Um, but, let, but let's talk about one technology that will forever change cyber. Right. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm all in an end-to-end -end encryption. And I, I think you know, the amazing thing about this technology is we've basically known how to do this ever, ever since 1976. You know, ever since the Diffie-Hellman paper, you know, we basically knew how to, how to make end-to-end -end encrypted apps. And it took us a while before we actually built them. Um, and you know, maybe 40 years later, we had the first uh, and to encrypted apps, like actually in people's hands. I know PGP was out there for a while trying to do this. And, um, you know, obviously it was a different time back then. And a lot of stuff in, in that system is great. A lot of it hasn't withstood the test of time. But um, I think we're getting closer to the point where it'll seem crazy to upload anything unencrypted to a cloud server. And, um, you know, we got to solve a lot of problems before we get there. We got to solve key management, as you said. We have to, we have to solve multi-device support. We have to solve, you know, group management, right? And all these things are, are related. They're not just you solve one at a time. They're only solved as part of a holistic team. But I think once you get there, I, I think it's going to change the world so that you don't have to be so worried about someone exfiltrating data. I, I mean, the best case scenario is the bad guy breaks in, they exfiltrate the data, what they get? They got ciphertext they can't decrypt. So I, I think, right. you know, I, I'm so excited for, for, for Zoom to be pushing this direction for other technologies to be pushing in this direction. And I think, you know, this is one of like the, the best tools we have to, to, 
to beat up, beat, beat off the, fight off the bad guys. Um, because, uh, you know, the, the endpoints are ready, your phone's ready to do the crypto. Uh, it's just we have to build the software to get there. So that's what I'm most excited about. So what book are you reading now? I'm reading a book about um, the Vietnam War. Uh, it's called uh, Edward Lansdale, The Path Not Taken. <laughs> And it's um it, have you read this book by Max Boot? Um, I have not. It's on my list. Okay, it's, it's a great book. It's you know it's about I think this particular analyst was was in charge of of fighting a, a a communist insurgency in the Philippines and did a great job in the fifties and sixties I think. And then you know he was now put on the Vietnam desk you know early in the Vietnam War. And I'm I'm halfway through it. I'm obviously obviously he's not gonna save the day, but I'm curious to know what happened and, and what processes might have, might have failed in order to, to give us, you know, give the outcome that, that we eventually wound up with. Indeed. So what's um, the last movie you saw? Uh, I recently saw uh, Palm Springs. Have you seen it? I have not. It's a great Is movie. It good? I don't want to give, I, I want to, don't want to give any spoilers, but I'm going to say it's, it's an installment in a genre, which you will recognize the genre and it's a good installment in that genre. Okay. So you'll see the movie What's your favorite time. music that you listen to while you're working? Oh my gosh, I listen to uh, I listen to some uh, a lot of Fish and the Grateful Dead on YouTube. I gotta say, <laughs> 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 yeah, I gotta get the Disney out of my head because my kids are always playing Disney music, and uh, that that stuff is really catchy. It's hard to get out of your head. So. Yeah, it's um, uh, Disney music is something that I want to burn forever and ever. <laughs> and ever. Well, that would make um, my kids very upset if I did that. So I know, but but if you can get your kids on Nirvana early, they'd never Ooh. like Disney. Ooh, that's interesting. Well, yeah, I, I think it's it's the whole package, right? It's the catchy music. It's like the princesses and the magic, and like you know the the ancient beautiful cities. You know, they, they got every they push all the right buttons. So my my kids <laughs> love it. <laughs> so, what's one thing you've took away from Solar Winds? Ah, solar winds. Well, good or bad. I mean, I, I guess I have been thinking. You know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, supply chain attacks. You know, where we get our libraries from. You know, what are we? What sort of analyses are we performing in our libraries? How do we upgrade our libraries? I think these are all sorts of things that solar winds brings up. I, you know, there's other really tricky question of, you know, how, when you patch, right? And how are you, how are you telling your users when to patch? And, you know, I feel like there's so many trade-offs on, on all sides of this. You know, as I mentioned with the Keybase example, you know, we were, we we're in a very slow patch schedule and, you know, there, there, there are benefits and costs to that. And so, you know, these are the types of things I think about. Um, it, it, it's hard to know. Um, it, it's hard to know what to make of it because we're not done with it yet. I don't think anyone knows exactly what happened in, in, in the worst of parts. You know, I, I was I was re reminded in, in Solar Winds of you know when I was in grad school, we had a research cluster um, get get attacked, um, and we knew that you know some bad guy somewhere was, was in that cluster, and we found like a PHP um, shell or something, and so there was pretty good evidence that they were there. And that was back in the days when MIT had these. Great them and great IP addresses like 18.26.4. something. That was that was a beautiful IP address. And if you were an attacker and you had that, you would show it off to all your friends. Um, and you know, my advisor at the time was an ex, like, like he was such an authority on security, and um, he had been through this for things like this for the last 30 years. And, and we went around, we patched all the machines, we reinstalled all the OSs, and at the end of the day, we looked at each other and we said. Are we done? Is this good enough? Like, have we gotten that guy out? We said, we don't know. And we, like, and uh, we just had to go back to our lives at some point. And of course, it didn't matter if it was just a research cluster, but like, we just didn't know. And so now I think about these government agencies that have like thousands of machines. And like, you know, are you all burning the machines to the ground at the same time? And in that case, then, yeah, the, they're not rooted. But like, any other thing short of that, you just don't know. And I feel like that. My gosh, I'm glad it's not my job to say this. This, this, this never could say because I, I don't know. It's hard to convince yourself it is. Yeah, um, Solar Winds was a wake up call for many, a uh, vindication for some, and a holy smokes! I've been sleeping on the job for a lot of others, yeah. and it's there. There's no easy solution for Solar Winds. Um, there's no 
you know, it's, it's, there, there's no silver bullet. There's no one thing that one person or one organization can do. And, and I think that's, that's gonna, you know, I think, and that's the advantage of it as well. And that's also the disadvantage of it is, um, you know, if, if you know your stuff and, and you're, you're smart and educated, you're able to spin this conversation and have a really fruitful one. And if not, um, you might find yourself uh, outmatched, outnumbered, and outjobbed at some point. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just a continual lesson that if it's if you can attack it, and if there's an attack vector that there's enough money on the line and enough expertise out there that it's going to be attacked. And ten years ago, that wasn't a problem. We just thought, oh, this, this yeah. attack's too hard to pull off. In 2021, it's like, no, nah, they're gonna they're gonna find a way. Absolutely. Well, Max, thank you so much for coming on the show. We are out of time, so I really appreciate it. Folks, Max Grown. Max, how can people connect with you? Uh, well, I, I have a Twitter account. I, I'm actually pretty uh, private nowadays, um, but I, every so often I, I'll, I'll you know, mention a product announcement on, on Twitter, and so that's uh, uh, at Max Taco, M-A-X-T-A-C-O, um, and uh, that's probably the best way, and I'll either be DM some of that. But, um, yeah, great way to get a hold Awesome. Folks, Max Crown, Head of Security Engineering over at Zoom. Thanks so much for everyone for watching and tuning into today's episode. I hope you got a lot out of it. You can connect with uh, with Max. He's a private person, but you might be able to find him on Twitter uh, uh, and, and and connect with him there. But, you know, um, um, having, having said that, you guys can also post comments below the video and all your questions, and we'll be happy to try to get some answers to those as well after the fact. That's it for us here today. We'll be back next week with more stuff. Make sure to go check out the Cyber Hub podcast. Daily uh, content posted there, 9 a.m. Eastern. I'm live with the practitioner brief. Until next week, folks. Max, thanks again for coming on. Thank you, James. Great to be here. And, folks, thanks so much for watching and giving us an hour of your time this week. And I hope you got a lot out of this interview as much as I did. Until then, folks, stay cyber safe. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast and share it with your friends and colleagues. And get all the latest information at cyberhubpodcast.com.